Hello, my name is Jake Higgs and I'm a 3D art teacher working with the Academy of Interactive Entertainment in Canberra, Australia. Today we're speaking with industry professional Clinton Crumper, who's a senior environment artist at The Coalition. And we're going to ask him a couple of questions today about his thoughts on breaking into the game industry and some useful and very helpful production ideologies and habits. Let's get started with our first question, which is one of the more common questions I get asked a lot, which is what is the pathway you took, Clinton, to first get into the games industry? Well, that's a good question. Uh, when, I, when I first decided I wanted to get into art after high school, I initially started out when I went to school for graphic design in Virginia uh, in the States at Longwood University. I did that for the first full four years and got my degree in graphic design. But I felt like there was just something missing. I just felt like even though I was okay with being a commercial artist, there was just something that I didn't feel was quite there. Uh, the magic wasn't as strong as I'd hoped it'd be creating art solely in Photoshop and Illustrator. So I pushed into looking more into going back to school to try something new. I ended up wanting to try animation, and I really liked the tools and creation methods at first glance. I started investigating schools around the area and on the East Coast that I could find and kind of go to and test out for myself. Uh, and while going through the animation curriculum, uh, I found the Savannah College of Art and Design, and I ended up going there uh, in Savannah, Georgia. I took some introductory classes into animation for games there, uh, and that was my first experience with the Unreal Engine. At the time, it was Unreal Engine 3, or also known as UDK. After working more and more with the engine and creating art and architecture, I realized it wasn't so much about the animation that I liked, but the modeling, texturing, and world building that I was really into. That's essentially what kind of brought me to environment art. So my background was founded through multiple disciplines, but I can firmly say that each of those things I did along the way were definitely helpful to form how I create art and how I make any kind of scene I make today. They were essential to establish my style, my workflows, and general approach that I take to all the scenes that I create. Knowing that those kind of graphic design and animation skills definitely helped me understand multiple parts of the production process and better understand my basically how I work in my, by myself or in large groups, and just to understand how other artists in multiple disciplines work. I find that every artist's background establishes their initial kind of approach to how they look at art, how they understand it, how they interpret it, and how they build their own. Awesome. Thanks for that, Clinton. On to our next question now, which is another highly requested one. It's sort of a couple of questions rolled into, into one here, is how long did it take for you to land your first job uh, in the games industry? sort of how did you enjoy that first job that you managed to get and how from this first job did you eventually end up working at the coalition where you are now the first job i had besides a small freelance gig was my job at the army game studio i found it by posting a bunch of work on polycount and finding the actual job opening on the polycount job board at that point i'd probably applied to over 100 jobs while trying to find work I'd applied to everything from 3D visualization, car model mock-ups, architectural companies, you name it. I knew I had to get my foot in the door and at least into some kind of 3D industry to at least start my career. I was lucky enough to find this role uh, at the Army Game Studio, uh, which essentially got me into the field I wanted to at least be in. Uh, when started there, I was super nervous, worried that I wouldn't be good enough, I didn't know the work that was required. I quickly found that everyone was super welcoming though, and it was really open, and not only to teaching, but to learning as well. It was a great place to start out as a, with a small but good team to learn the ropes and to understand the production process. My time there was relatively short as I applied for a gig in San Francisco a little bit less than a year later, as I was already, always a city person at heart and I'd always wanted to move to the West Coast. I ended up landing a gig at a smaller uh, company called Kixai, or a startup out of San Francisco. After moving there and beginning the project, uh, the team in the studio was awesome. Uh, we were working on a mobile game at first, and then eventually they actually transitioned that into a full AAA platform title. Uh, and this was one of the first uh, kind of times I was able to really get a hand on AAA game development. This was a great experience as it was a small team, so I was able to work with multiple people, uh, learn from a lot of different disciplines and game production. A lot of industry veterans were there, and it was really good. After that, I worked at Bethesda's Battlecry studio in Austin for a while, and then finding myself here in Vancouver at the Coalition. Each job I found along the way was from one of two ways. The first way was that I posted my work regularly online for feedback and exposure. So someone had either seen my work and wanted to bring me on board because of it, or they have heard of me from online somewhere. 
The second was from references from friends that I had gone to school with or worked with or friends of those friends. I still believe that both of these are the best ways an artist can break into the industry and having those contacts and having that exposure is super important. Connecting with fellow artists and putting yourself out there is where it's at. Thanks for sharing that, Clinton. I think it's really important for artists that are just starting out to pay close attention, not just to the amount of jobs that you're applying for, but the different industries you're applying for too, just after school. Uh, which actually leads into my next question, which is how long exactly after you finished your, your studies did it take for you to land that first job? Well, after finishing my first degree with graphic design, I worked all summer on random jobs while I decided what to do next. I felt a bit aimless and not quite sure what road or path to take next. Uh, this is when I ended up going back to school to get my degree in animation and game design. While there, I started applying for full-time work about a year and a half away from graduating. I wanted to make sure I had a good head start to not make the same mistakes I had made before by waiting too long. After school ended, I had an offer that I ended up turning down as it was too far away as I was working in Germany on car modeling and it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. I applied to multiple other places and waited about four to six months after school before finally deciding on taking that position at the Army Game Studio in Alabama for my first real gig in the industry. So another question for you here, Clinton, is uh, what drove you into environment art, say, over something like your graphic design or animation background that you initially studied? Hmm. Well, when I first started doing graphic design and animation, I really enjoyed both. I loved the creative aspects of each, but as I learned more and more about what a commercial artist will do with those skills, I felt like there was a bit of lost magic. It felt like there was, I would be one part in a, of a gear or uh, of an overall machine. With graphic design, uh, there was so much direction from your client that it can be challenging to find the creative freedom in your own designs. Um, and with animation, I felt like I played a smaller role in the overall making of a film or short, much smaller than say I wanted to at the time. This is not to say that either of these talents are any less or more important as I have the highest respect for all the work involved in both. I just mean to say that it doesn't satisfy the creative cravings that I was looking for at that time exactly. So these kind of conclusions led me to environment art. Uh, what I really like about environment art is that you can either, you can either be the master uh, of commander of your own project at home and create every detail, nook, cranny, uh, solo, or in a workplace where you can create a larger and more challenging work with coworkers and kind of collaborative uh, kind of efforts to reach the overall same artistic goals. Uh, knowing that I had such a wide variety of creative control um, and that I was able to collaborate and kind of work with other people in kind of a similar kind of ideology, uh, I was able to kind of show the kind of final piece and kind of overall design that I was, I was wanting to carry through in, in my art and creation style. Uh, and so that's really what kind of spoke to me with environment art. So on the subject of art tests, Clinton, uh, how do you feel artists should approach art tests and are there any good tips you can give on how to tackle art tests overall? Oh yes, art tests. Art tests are a tricky subject. I've done a few in my time and they're becoming increasingly difficult and more time consuming as more people are trying to get jobs within the industry. The market is tough and employers want to make sure they know that you can get the job done and are really invested in your craft. When getting an art test, you want to make sure you fully understand what they're asking you to accomplish. Are they asking you for your creative take on a sketch or design? Or does it seem like they're just testing you less on creative thinking and more on your ability to craft an asset using a specific software package? Really fully understanding the task at hand can help you to save you a lot of time and energy along the way. Spend your time and effort where it's needed to make sure you're getting, giving your 100% where they want to actually see it at. Research the company, learn how they make assets, and what software they use to make those assets. Try and understand their production pipeline and workflows. Understanding and using the same methods and knowledge that they'll be using within their actual production setting can really show an employer that you really could be easily integrated into their artistic community. When submitting your work, remember presentation is king. No matter how great your texture, work, or your model, or your lighting, it can all look mediocre if not presented well. Look at other examples of how professional artists are presenting their work online currently. Use those as references to understand how to properly light, edit, and present your work to, present to potential employers to have the best and most memorable impact of those people. Also remember to protect yourself. 
read and understand any contract involved in creating work for an art test. Make sure that the work is still yours and or it can't be used in a production setting without your permission. The worst feeling would be to work on a project for weeks and then not to be able to get to show it to anyone because somewhere in the contract it states it can't be shown after the art test. Because at least sometimes if you spend a lot of time on say a project or uh, an art test, then you can put that in your portfolio and maybe that might help you to secure another job later on. Lastly, balance your time and energy. If you're taking on an art test and a full-time job or maybe more than one art test at a time, make sure to pace yourself. Try and structure how you're gonna be doing each thing throughout the day and break down your day-to-day -day structure so you make sure to get everything done that you need. Thanks for that, Clinton. That was some really great advice. Um, for our next question, what are some things you did sort of early on in your career that really helped you land your first job? And if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? Well, I would say one of the biggest things I've learned since leaving school is the importance of online presence. I first discovered it when I was uh, in my last months of school. I'd entered a contest online hosted by 3D Motive at the time to create a game-ready robot in a, th a thousand tries. I surprisingly won the contest and I was really excited about this and I quickly became aware of the impact it had uh, when I talked to a few places uh, that I had been interviewing with only to find out that they knew me through the contest. Seeing the impact that that had on my ability to break into the industry, I began to bolster my online presence, portfolio, and interactions on forums such as Polycount, Game Artisans, and other such websites that I was using at the time. Also, funnily enough, this is honestly where I hear that most people have the biggest issue when they're trying to break into the industry. Uh, many artists say they're too afraid to post on ArtStation or Polycount because they're worried about the feedback they'll receive or that their work is not quite good enough for public view yet. It's a really hard thought to shake, but I assure you it's very important that you do. Most of the artistic communities are more than happy to help varying levels of artists to develop their skills and abilities without much judgment. The internet can be a scary place, but I always find that sites like Polycount foster wonderful communities to help new artists grow and learn in a safe environment. Put yourself out there, and most times I think you'll find that you'll be more than happy with the results and the help that you'll get. This leads me to my last point, which is networking. I cannot tell you how many contracts and freelance gigs I've received through people I was friends with during college, met online during, the, during like in forums, or other such methods. Keeping strong contacts and branching out to talk to other artists and creators is a great way to help you in the industry. Many times people will choose working with someone that they really like or enjoy being around compared to someone they know nothing about, regardless of the skills of both people. Also remember, making connections with people not specifically in your circle of expertise is also super helpful. Talk to programmers, technicians, and other talents that you will not only learn from each other, but you'll also widen your circle of contacts. Thanks for that, Clinton. That was actually some really great career advice. And I also really encourage uh, young artists that are just starting out to really get involved with the online communities. As you mentioned before, they are really friendly and really want to offer their help and advice. So on to another question now, which is a little bit about actually completing some work in a studio. I think this is a great question. Say you're in a situation where you're working on a particularly hard or really challenging tasks at work and uh, a task that you might end up getting stuck on sort of how do you go about overcoming these obstacles and staying motivated so you make sure you hit your deadlines? Oh, sure. Uh, so, well, sometimes working on a project, tasks can definitely arise that are more challenging to you than others. You'll often find that a particular skill set will often make you uh, kind of a go-to for a particular task uh, that kind of comes up during production. For example, when I was working on Gears of War 4, uh, I was given the the task of working on the swarm pods due to my understanding of material workflows in Unreal uh, and the ability to sculpt in ZBrush. This task was not a usual task for an environment artist that would be working on as it's kind of more of a uh, similar task to what a character artist would receive with its organic nature and visuals uh, of the swarm pod. As challenging as it seemed at first, taking it one step at a time and really planning out, out how, how each aspect of the pod interacted with the environment, characters, viz effects, and overall gameplay I was able to make some sound decisions that allowed me to complete the task. Throughout the process, there were multiple times I felt stuck technically or visually, uh, and this is where the best part about working in larger groups and art, and art teams came into play. With each stumble or issue that arose, I was able to talk to other members of the team and not only conquer each issue uh, independently, 
uh, but also learn new valuable skills and information about aspects of development that I might not have had the chance to do if I was not taking on such a challenging task. Just thinking about how taking on hard tasks step by step and taking it st you know, one step at a time to really kind of figure out where you are at and during the process will kind of help you to reach your end goals because then you can kind of take it you know, in smaller bite-sized chunks comparatively just kind of looking at the whole and kind of being intimidated by the overall um, task at hand. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're, you're taking on any kind of larger or more challenging tasks than you're, you're typically used to. Awesome. So on to our next uh, question now, Clinton. Say I'd like to apply for a studio, but I don't currently know any of the tools that they're using. Do you have any advice for that? Sure. I, I don't think every company expects you to know every software package or creation system while starting there. Many times a studio will even have their own engine that can be specific to only them that you could have had no prior chance to experience. Uh, when looking for candidates, studio, you, studios usually look for people that know general software packages that are the same or similar to the ones they use. Um, and then they kind of look to your work to make sure that you know or understand the underlying processes and procedures involved in each uh, kind of overall look development or how that software package essentially um, kind of gets you to your final goal. Remember, all software out there is just a tool. And at the end of every day, the company just wants a good product uh, from you, the creator, to give to the buyer. Also, when starting anywhere new, remember to use your resources and people around you at the studio. Many times I, I might struggle on a technical issue or might have problems with some sort of uh, process that I'm working on, but I know I can simply ask for a few minutes of help from a coworker to get this resolved. You'll find that in most healthy studios, this is a common practice as it's assumed that they might have you know, some kind of question uh, or particular part of the pipeline that you don't, you don't, you have no ability to understand. Uh, this is when you would ask someone else definitely to, you know, for a little bit of help. And then it's kind of assumed that if someone new is coming in or someone that doesn't have, you know, kind of experience with the software packages that you're using, they could come to you for help as well. I think the biggest thing is that no one minds helping someone as long as they show initiative and they're trying to solve the problem or work things out on their own first before coming to someone else to kind of ask that initial question. Cool. Uh, so Clinton, when you got your first job, uh, what type of work did you have in your portfolio and what should beginning artists sort of try to aim to have in their portfolios? Well, when I landed my first job, I had a bit of a variety of things in my portfolio. I had two environments of a relatively small size, uh, one level design walkthrough, and a handful of props and textures. I can't say there's any exact formula to what is required in a portfolio, but I can say this. All good portfolios, in my opinion, have a good mixture of two parts, micro and macro artwork. What, am I, what I mean by this is essentially there's a balance between the types of works that you should show. Micro work is the work most environment artists breaking into the industry typically show. It's a prop or a texture or a single asset. Showing these assets, you break down textures and you show how it was constructed. This shows micro attention to detail, how you refine each small aspect of the asset and how you kind of work through its construction. This is good to show employers you understand the creation and workflow processes to create assets for games. The second part or the ma macro work is sometimes left out or is not well crafted. This is the creation of a small scene, diorama, or other piece that shows a wider range of thought. This type of work shows that you can see big picture and that you understand how individual assets, textures, and parts of the environment come together to form an overall pleasing composition or aesthetic. This also shows how you are a completionist, basically meaning you're able to get, you're understanding the pace of how, you know, how you're going through your process and you understand the whole workflow of getting an entire environment done and not getting caught on every single little bit along the way. Keeping both of these in mind while crafting your portfolio, I find it will help to create a super strong presence and a nice balance of presentation. So onto a question about your team at the Coalition, Clinton. How many artists do you currently work with at the Coalition and how big would you say is a normal sized art team for a studio? Our teams can really vary in size depending on the production and also studio. Uh, there are multiple art groups when it comes to the Coalition specifically, ranging from level design, vis effects, animation, etc. Um, environment art specifically, there is anywhere from six to nine uh, artists ranging from where we're at during production. Uh, this is one of the smaller teams I've had worked on uh, with other studios, may he had even double to triple that amount. 
Um, and other uh, AAA art studios may even have quadruple or even more, uh, depending on what the particular project they're working on is. It really depends on the project and how the work is distributed. Uh, we also work with external partners, such as Splash Damage, to get some of the uh, major multiplayer and other uh, parts of production done on time. Um, and this is also really helpful to kind of keep the team small in-house uh, to kind of have some work uh, externally. Thanks, Ed Clinton. That's a much smaller team size than I actually would have expected. Uh, so on to our next question now. Uh, what are some of the most challenging aspects you find while working in the industry, and how do you overcome these challenges? That's definitely a good one. Uh, there'll never be a time, I think, when an artist feels completely content with the work they're doing every single day. This is a curse and a blessing of being a commercial artist. Having a steady role while not, not always getting to make the most creative and fun content. Some days you may go into work and find that you're handed a mediocre or meh task at best. These tasks can sometimes seem daunting and slow paced, but finding ways to balance these tasks, tasks out in your life with more artistic tasks, you'll find more ways to enjoy the ones that you really do like and that kind of help to remedy that commercial artist blues. At the Coalition, when getting tasks, I try to vary it up to make sure I don't get caught on one type of asset or production type. Sometimes switching between structural assets to textures to props can kind of help alleviate the symptoms of uh, you know, too much repetition. Also, while at home, I tend to work on things that are very opposite from what I'm doing at work. Uh, just mixing it up throughout the day and throughout your daily life and routine can help you keep, you know, keep feeling satisfied and overall creatively operative. So we're going to move on to a couple of questions now, Clinton, regarding software. Uh, how important do you think it is to know different kinds of software? And what skills do you see becoming more important in the future as software continues to evolve? Uh, is there anything that you do in particular to stay up to date as an environment artist with current trends in software? Software is always a big subject for sure. Um, as time goes by, software and workflows will always change though. It's the nature of the technical industry. Knowing this is an important thing to stay up to date uh, with all the current trends. I'm constantly on the watch for emerging trends and software packages or ways that th different, different ways to think about creating art and how I can use those software packages to kind of help me achieve those looks. Some of the biggest ones to watch right now are Substance Painter and Quixel Suite. Uh, both are powerful packages and prove to be invaluable in saving time to create textures for your assets. It's funny that uh, when I first started, uh, there was tons of small tricks and things that I'd learned in Photoshop to kind of get certain results in my texturing workflows. And many of these techniques are not really used as much anymore because you know they're integrated into how you use and create textures in uh, Quixel and Substance. Uh, but knowing some of these techniques and workflows can still help me understand what the software package is essentially doing under the hood uh, and how they're able to manipulate masking and a different other blending techniques they're able to use. And also, of course, uh, visual node network systems such as Substance Designer and Unreal Material Editor are both very great things for environment artists to know and to understand as they help visual learners understand some of the math processes that happen in game engines. Knowing a bit of technical creation can really put your skill set slightly above other applicants for a job that only know art, especially in smaller studios when there's a wider range of knowledge can make you a more versatile member of the team. Last, knowing a game engine is important as well. Just generally knowing a game engine is really good. Uh, two of the most biggest right now are the Unreal Engine and Unity, and sometimes people uh, will talk about Cry a lot as well. Uh, they're great to know because they can help you get your foot in the door with most companies ranging from mobile to AAA to uh, eight game development because most of these engines are used in those companies. So knowing that will definitely help you kind of get your foot in the door. So Clinton, do you have any other artists that inspire you? Artists that inspire me? Yes, definitely tons. Uh, some of my most favorite traditional artists or I guess relatively uh, digital traditional artists uh, is Ian McHugh. He makes those uh, really cool colored flying boat ships you see sometimes. Uh, using really interesting brush strokes and marks really brings uh, his compositions to life. I'm also a big fan of Alphonse Mucha. Uh, I love Art Nouveau work and all the ad prints and posters. I think his handiwork is really beautiful, even being more overall a commercial artist uh, for art's sake. But I think that's what really is compelling about his work is that it's, uh, he was a commercial artist during his time as most of his work was uh, ad you know, print and things like that. Um, but overall, he was able to really carry through like beautiful compositions into those um, advertising campaigns. I also love some of Banksy's work. It's a little bit more loose, but I think that's more, uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, more of the ideas and processes attached to the work are, are really what makes it interesting. Uh, it's, it makes a lot of questions. It's kind of similar to the, the Dadaism movement and other such like kind of anti-art art movements. 
And then when it comes to the other digital artists, I have a couple other as well. I really uh, admire and respect artists that you know are kind of active in the community. Uh, I've learned so much from places like Polycount when it comes to the industry, and you know the information that people are willing to share their knowledge for free with up and coming artists is great. Uh, people such as Horsens and you know Josh Lynch uh, are awesome to have in the art community because they're you know definitely overall bettering the quality of artists and the quality of people that you're going to find, you know, uh, creating content and work on, you know, places like Polycount and ArtStation and th things of that nature. So Clinton, I've got a couple of uh, questions here about time management and planning when it comes to your personal projects. Uh, are there any consistent things you do say in terms of your planning to make sure you really stay on top of your projects and hit your own self-imposed deadlines? Time management, yeah, definitely. Uh, I talk a lot about this topic with students I teach because uh, it, it can be one of the most challenging topics for con new commercial artists. All artists want to always want to make sure everything looks perfect. This can quickly lead to time sinks and longer production times uh, for time spent on certain aspects of you know tweaking the visuals of a scene. Uh, the biggest useful tool when it comes to this, I find, is the tool that I use is Trello. Uh, it's sort of a visual task management system. I use it to self-manage and scope any project I'm working on on my own as well as with uh, you know other freelance projects I do. It also allows me to organize my thoughts uh, early in production and keep eyes on what's most important throughout the project uh, to make sure I get it done on time. I prefer Trello to say something like Jira for tasks specifically at home because it's simple and it's visual based compared to say something like the word heavy uh, informational kind of use of Jira. Um, I use Jira at work but it's just something I, I prefer at home with being Trello. Uh, I'm sure everyone has some, uh, you know, some kind of evening. They'll sit down and they'll start to work on a personal project that they've, you know, worked on or been, you know, doing at home for a couple of months or weeks. And they'll say, "Oh, I'll just tweak this thing here, then I'll fix this thing up, and then so on and so forth until the night is over." And you can't quite say what you change for the better in your scene. Uh, so applications like Trello will help this keep this from happening, as you can kind of keep track on what you worked on last, how long you should work on it, and what's coming up next. So you can kind of keep, you know, eyes on the overall project. Also, keeping track of how long it took you uh, and marking down, you know, on the Trello board is helpful to see later when you're tracking to see, you know, how much work, how much time it took to actually do the work, uh, and so you can know for you know similar props or assets or textures how long it'll actually take you to complete those aspects as well. Uh, you can look back later, you know, a couple weeks or a couple months or even years later, and be like, oh, it took me, you know, two weeks to complete this asset, and now I can do it much faster, and that's, you know, it's really nice to see that you know, time improvement. So back on the topic of uh, presentation a little bit here, Clinton, uh, lighting and post-processing seems to play a major part in a lot of your work. How much time do you actually spend lighting your scenes and how do you go about deciding how to approach lighting your scenes? Also, do you have any particular methods that you use to decide and develop uh, color palettes and different tweaks you might make to your post-processing? Oh yeah, I definitely love uh, those aspects. Um, the more time I spend working on environment art and learning about how to craft a scene to a specific look, the more I find myself working with lighting in general. It's always an evolving part of the creative process. When initially creating a scene, it's important to kind of add base lights in to get an idea of how you're framing your shots and compositions and overall just light direction. Using these lights as a guide can not only help you make important decisions on where to focus the attention in your scene, but also help you to make creative choices and color uh, and silhouette and the shapes and sizes. Um, I usually start with a few core lights to get myself going and then I'll come back towards the end of the project for test baking and realignment to get the best feel in silhouette framing. I find that I spend about 20 to 30 percent of the time actually making uh, the scene, experimenting with post-process and lighting. Uh, and that's, it's one of the key ingredients to the overall mood that I like to create uh, when I'm kind of completing my scene. This leads to color and, uh, and post-processing. When I start a new scene, I try to quickly establish my color palette and value range. When beginning to work with texturing, it's important to know the key colors that you'll be using in your scene to make sure that each asset helps to complement each other and does not over overpower the uh, main colors that you're trying to push through the foreground. I find that looking for references such as film, paintings, and other games are really helpful. Blurring an image of a movie or other reference still uh, in Photoshop will expose the key colors of that composition and shot uh, so you can kind of know what you know their main kind of color palette they're using for that shot was, and you can kind of use that to kind of get an idea of how you want to use that in your own. Uh, knowing just generally overall how other artists are able to get good kind of color palettes, you can kind of use this to help this to help to establish your own particular color palette for each scene that you create. So Clinton, uh, what software packages are you currently using at the moment? Well, currently I'm using Photoshop, ZBrush, Maya, Unreal, Mighty Bake, Quixel Suite. Uh, some substance, 
and Nald is my primary tools of choice. So Clinton, how do you go about gathering reference for your scenes? Are there any major places of influence uh, you might go to, say, to gather reference for visuals and look development, and any other places you might go to to gather reference to help with constructing either an asset or an entire scene? Oh yeah, reference is a fun one. Uh, my favorite uh, reference gathering tool so far has been Pinterest. A lot of folks that haven't had a chance to use it are still in firm believers that it's only for wedding planner or diet tea or home decoration, but trust me, so many great artists out there are using it. It's basically a collective or hive mind of references that draws from other people you follow and images that you like. I also love the ability to organize into different categories and per project. Uh, it's also super useful for saving references together and then sharing them with other members of the team or other artists that you know that kind of are looking for a particular uh, look or reference kind of category. Uh, as everything is basically available at, at online, online at all times. So say for instance, my friend wants to know more about you know some good rocks that uh, would be to sculpt. So I have a whole Pinterest board full of just rocks that I've found from other artists or online or in other games that I really liked. So I'll save that to that one board that I can then share with other artists later on or come back to reference to myself later um, at any time during, during my use or kind of art creation process. Uh, as for construction methods, I really look anywhere on the web that I can get information. I think the one thing that is often over, overlooked is, is how something man-made was created. Some artists create a metallic AC unit or a crafting or a refrigerator and forget to add breaks in the panels or seam lines where the different pieces of metal used to create the real world object are placed together and kind of welded or fixed or kind of glued or attached. I really find that making sure you include these in your models can really sell the believability uh, I try to carry this through all my aspects of my environment art as well to keep an eye on how those things were crafted or could be crafted when pieced, pieced together from real world materials such as wood, metal, plastic, etc. For gathering references for mood and lighting, I, I looked a lot to films and painters as I talked about before. Uh, for the most recent subway train I did and subway tunnel environment I did, I looked at a few select references ranging from films such as the Nolan Batman films, um, some paintings from Caravaggio, uh, and some nighttime photography I found through Pinterest. Lastly, I look at other 3D artists, uh, see how they are crafting and creating their scenes and artworks. Remember, every famous artist you know uh, throughout time was not without influence from another artist before them. Art takes references from the past uh, to create future, and no artist should be inside the box protected from other artists' influences, as it will kind of prevent you from really growing as an overall artist. So Clinton, uh, you've spoken a, a lot in the past how you find it very important to incorporate story elements to try to tell a visual narrative uh, through your scenes. Can you explain how you've uh, incorporated some story elements into your subway train scene? Sure, I can do that. Um, visual storytelling and customizing a scene are by far my favorite aspect of crafting an environment. I love creating special story beats and elements that entice the viewer to study the scene more closely and really try to understand the visual connection within the space. Uh, when creating visual story elements and background commentary, it's important to try and keep your, your art from knocking the player or the viewer from over the head as what they should think or what they should do or how they should understand the story. To me, it's more about the subtle clues that reward the viewer for paying attention and kind of connecting the dots visually within the scene. When teaching, I always tell my students to remember these key ingredients for crafting a scene. The first is tone or mood. This is a feeling or emotional response intended for the viewer while seeing or exploring the scene. Uh, the next is time, a uh, time period or hour or season in which the scene is uh, set during. The next is place, where in the world is it, uh, the galaxy or where the scene is overall located. The next is history or passage of time. Uh, this is basically what has happened in the scene over its lifetime. Has it been flooded? Maybe it's been more than once. Uh, is the wood rotting away? Is there? Is it been freshly painted? How can you convey this message to the viewer? The next is cause and effect. This is the use of visual cues or context to show something happened or is still happening in the space. Blood trails leading to a body that could be an example of this. The next is focus and direction. This is how you draw the attention or the viewer attention to the specific area or specific aspect of the scene. And the last is established identity. Using iconography, markings, logo, branding, or other such met methods can kind of help establish a believable identity to certain aspects or features with a scene to kind of give the idea that the world is living, that it's already, it was already pre-existing before you were able to view the space. All these methods and ideologies work in tandem to help craft visual narratives in the environment. 
I'd like to finish up today by extending a huge thank you to Clinton for joining us and providing his valuable industry knowledge and expertise in answering these questions. Yeah, definitely, Jake. I really enjoy always talking about this kind of thing uh, with kind of people that want to know more about just generally getting into the industry. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on.